Thank you, Laura, and thanks so much for having Mike and me here. We love New Mexico. This is my third time here. Uh, you all have a southern pottery tradition too, but it's a very different one. It's a southwestern Pueblo tradition, and I'm beginning to fall in love with the stuff. And got to visit Acoma yesterday, and uh, I believe I'll be back. <laughs> Face jugs are among the most intriguing objects made by southern folk potters, capturing the imagination of collectors, museum curators, researchers, and potters today. Where did they come from, and what have they meant to their makers and owners in the past as well as today? A review of the story as I've come to understand it should make clear that the answers are anything but simple. While these sculpted humanoid vessels are referred to generically as face jugs, people pots may be a better name for them, since some are full-bodied figurals, like this example made about 1890 by William Grinstaff of Knoxville, Tennessee. Or are other vessel forms besides jugs, like this face pitcher from 19th century South Carolina. Early examples from the South survive, but information about them is so scant that later theories about origin and meaning are at best educated guesswork. Not always so educated. These pieces, some of the oldest Southern examples, were made in the 1860s by enslaved African-American potters of Edgefield District, South Carolina. Created in a white-owned shop using the European technology of the potter's wheel and kiln, which incidentally in the South is pronounced with a silent N as kill, and the European jug form, they're coated with wood ash or lime-based alkaline glazes that are probably Asian in inspiration. Yet the tendency has been to argue an African origin for these. This was the case with ceramics historian Edwin Atley Barber, the first to write about face jugs in the 1909 edition of his Pottery and Porcelain of the United States. Many of the South Carolina examples can be attributed to slave potters working at the Palmetto Firebrick Works, founded in 1862 at Bath in Aiken County, based on Barber's communication with the shop's owner, Colonel Thomas Davies. As Barber put it, these curious objects possess considerable interest as representing an art of the Southern Negroes, uninfluenced by civilization, and we can readily believe that the modeling reveals a trace of aboriginal art as formerly practiced by the ancestors of the makers in the Dark Continent. Face jugs are associated with the black population in this early published image on an 1882 stereoscope card labeled an aesthetic darkie. It was taken by photographer J.A. Palmer of Aiken, South Carolina, and is part of a series on Aiken and vicinity, which lies in Edgefield District, where the illustrated face jug certainly was made. With its stirrup handle across the top and angled off-center spouts, the pot, like this faceless South Carolina example, is known in the South as a monkey jug, a type of water or feel jug named for, from an Afro-Caribbean Afro term for thirst. Such jugs were common in Africa, this is a Nigerian example, and in Mediterranean Europe, especially in Spain, where it was called a botijo, and there are actually three museums in Spain dedicated exclusively to variations of this form. So the monkey jug form itself could indeed be an African contribution to Southern folk pottery, the basic vessel. But is applying a face onto a clay vessel, such as this Edgefield slave-made monkey jug, also an African idea? That's the big issue. There were, in fact, anthropomorphic ceramic traditions in West Africa. For example, the younger people of Nigeria made portrait pots called wiso to channel ancestral spirits at shrines. 
the Azande people on the border of southern Sudan and the Democratic Republic of Congo made these beautifully detailed head bottles. While in northern Congo, the Mangbetu made portrait jugs for drinking palm wine. However, I found no indication that such African examples were made before the 1880s, too late to have influenced South Carolina slaves. An alternative theory of African influence is the possible media switch to clay from the mixed media power figures called Nikisi, used by Congo people to receive magical help from ancestral spirits. A fresh infusion of African culture to Edgefield District occurred in 1858 with Congo slaves from the illegal slave ship Wanderer, at least one of whom seems to have been working at Thomas Davies Pottery in 1863. Uh, his English name was Romeo. Compare the China inserts for the eyes on these Nikisi, the color white representing passage to the spirit world, with the white clay eyes and teeth of these African American examples from South Carolina. Some of the slave made pieces are too small to have been very useful as practical containers. The figural bottle is attributed to a black potter named Jim Lee about 1870 and is said to be a caricature of a local preacher, although he is dressed in a military costume. Given their often angry expressions and negroid features, these antebellum face vessels may have been nonverbal expressions of protest against enslavement, perhaps applying the, sorry, the African belief system known as conjure by functioning as mojos or magical charms. If you're familiar with the blues, you may know the line, got my mojo working, which can be used for good or evil or to call, cause people to fall in love with you or to do harm. So these may have been intended to do harm to slave owners. And in some of the literature, they are referred to as voodoo jugs, but I think that is not the term that the makers used. Complicating the pursuit of origins for southern people pots is the fact that anthropomorphic vessels are nearly universal among clay working societies. And there are only a few cultures in the world that don't have a strong clay working tradition. Potter's awareness of the corporeal character of their vessels is revealed by the anatomical terms used to describe the parts of the pots, at least in the English language. Mouth, lip, neck, shoulder, belly, foot. The type of clay a pot is made of is often referred to as its body, which can be fat or lean. Some of you are potters and you know this. Is it any wonder then that Potters the world over, including the American South, have seen clay as a sort of mirror, a reflection of their humanity, exploiting its plastic nature to sculpt it into a human likeness. Effigy pots like this North Carolina example are found at Native American sites of the Mississippian or mound building period, too early to have influenced the 19th century Southern face jug tradition. Mississippian head pots dating to around 1400, that is Christian era, CE, have been found further west in Arkansas. Humanoid clay vessels are also common in Latin America, such as this Mayan head jar from Guatemala, dating to around 800. This moche portrait stirrup jug from Peru dating to about 100 BCE. And this Shipibo Conibo water jar, also from Peru, made in the Amazon rainforest about 1965 as part of a living native tradition there. To extend the global distribution of anthropomorphic vessels beyond the Americas, we can start in China, where this Neolithic Banshan effigy jar from the Yellow River area 
was made in about 2200 BCE. And these are found in burial sites. This lidded cremation urn with its minimalist face is from the Swat Valley of Pakistan and dates to the early Gandhara Kingdom, about 1200 BCE. This Canaanite head pot from Jericho, Israel, was made about 1800 BCE. Sago pots for palm starch with human or animal faces are still being made in Papua New Guinea, like this 20th century example from the Yatmul people of Ibam village. Moving to Europe, some humanoid vessels are also ancient. This stylized face pot from Lobzonica, Poland, dates to the 6th century BCE. Were the potters of Attica who made these biracial face jugs about 500 BCE merely creating novelties, suggesting the interdependence of Ethiopian slaves and their Greek mistresses, or proposing something more revolutionary? This medieval face jug from Rimenswal, Belgium, dates to the late 1300s and includes a nativity scene with the three kings. In France, there were a number of local traditions of humanoid vessels, both early and late. This figural jug from Saintage is from the early 17th century. Marie Talbot of Le Bourne, Hoberry, made this ash-glazed stoneware dispenser for table use in the shape of a fashionable lady about 1840. And Louis Leopold Thuillant of Prevail, Sarth, included this lead-glazed earthenware image of a butcher in his series of local occupations in the 1880s. This impulse to humanize clay has been stronger in some cultures than in others. In England, it emerged several times, first with cremation urns by Roman potters there, some so detailed that I wonder if they were actual caricatures of the deceased. Then in the Middle Ages, when figural jugs were especially prevalent in the London area, this night jug is from Kingston-upon-Thames in Surrey and dates to the 1300s. Again, in the 17th century, with this rare example from Rudum, Kent, also near London, with white clay eyes and teeth. And finally flourishing as the Toby Jug, a slip cast character drinking vessel with a rise of Staffordshire's pottery industry in the 1760s. These are still being made. While a few South Carolina face vessels have pitcher mouths that seem to be echoes of Toby's tricorn hat, I don't believe England was the source of the Southern tradition. So where else shall we look? A German tradition of humanoid jugs is another possible influence on American face jugs. Known as a Bartmannskrug, or Bellarmine, these salt-glazed stoneware jugs made from the 16th through the 18th century, this example from late 1500s Cologne, have a bearded face mask molded onto the shoulder. Now, one of America's first stoneware potters was John Ramey, who in 1735 came from the Rhineland to New York City. His descendants continued to make stoneware in New York, Baltimore, and Philadelphia and were responsible for some of the earliest Euro-American face vessels, likely evolved from the German Bartmann tradition, I believe. This face pitcher, dated 1838, is attributed to John's great-grandson, Henry Ramey Jr. of Philadelphia, and was made as a presentation piece for a neighbor 
named Lewis Iyer. Here's a clear case of the Remy's influencing the Southern face joke tradition. German-born Charles Decker, who had worked at the Ramey Pottery in Philadelphia, migrated with his family to the Chucky Valley of northeastern Tennessee, where he established the Keystone Pottery and made this salt-glazed stoneware face jug in the 1880s, uh, similar in some ways to what the Ramey's were making, uh, with cobalt blue highlighting the, the hair. Back in Philadelphia, this two-face jug was made in 1858 by Henry Ramey Jr. or his son Richard. Note that these last three examples have facial hair highlighted with cobalt blue as do some of the German Bartmann jugs, bearded man jugs. Where the Ramey's and other northern potters encountered the African and Mediterranean field jug, that particular form with the stirrup handle across the top and the two off-center spouts is a mystery as it was not made in Germany or in Britain. Possibly people were bringing souvenirs back from Spain is one possibility. This lead-glazed earthenware face jug with its white clay inserts for the eyes and teeth is attributed to white Virginia-born potter Thomas Chandler in the late 1820s when he was working in Baltimore, Maryland. He worked with Henry Ramey Sr. and Jr. there before winding up in Edgefield District, South Carolina about 1835. This ash-glazed, happy-faced field jug signed by Thomas Chandler was made in Edgefield District about 1850, a decade earlier than the slave-made pieces from Thomas Davies' Palmetto Firebrick works. One researcher believes that this was Chandler's personal drinking jug, raising the question of use and meaning for the white potters who made such face vessels. These face vessels have what I describe as a masculine aesthetic of the ugly. In contrast to the kind of decoration on wares made for women's use, this is also by Thomas Chandler, but you can see his lacy swag motif in trailed slip, white liquid clay, uh, on this mixing bowl using his more refined lime-based alkaline glaze, smoother and lighter in color, also made at the same time as the face jug I just showed you, about 1850, suggesting a distinction based on gender uh, use in folk potter's choice of form and decoration. As we've already seen, the intended meaning of older face jugs can be obscure to us. The inscription on this example of the 1880s, signed by white potter Jesse Ham of Perry County, Alabama, reads, drink my blood. Is this a reference to the Eucharist? And is the bearded face meant to be a portrait of Jesus Christ? Not a very flattering portrait, to be sure. This lime-glazed face jug is attributed to Crawford County, Georgia's Eddie Averett, whose daughter, Lucille Wills, provided me with a rare insight into the social context of face jugs in the 1920s. She writes, Papa made face jugs for sale. It tickled the men that bought them to think they had something funny looking to put their whiskey in. Others bought them for inside the home decorations and to sit on the porch where they could be seen. My mama, Bertha Pender Averett, made the faces on the jugs. And so this was a collaboration uh, between husband and wife. The teeth were made out of broken up pieces of white china. The face jugs, says Lucille Wills, look scary to me as a child, so I particularly stayed away from them. Again, the masculine aesthetic of the ugly. This example, made at Atlanta's Brown Pottery around 1930, has a lizard modeled on the forehead and is inscribed on the throat just Grace and me, and the baby makes three. 
I'm sure some of you will know the inspiration for that line in popular song. Anybody? My Blue Heaven. And that helps us date this piece to between 1927, when that song became a hit, and the time when the brown pottery closed around 1931. Brothers Davis and J. Van Brown left the Atlanta area to establish the Brown Pottery at Arden, North Carolina, in the mountains of Buncombe County in 1925, and were probably among those who introduced the idea of the face jug to that state, North Carolina. They made large devil jugs to attract business customers, such as this unglazed and painted example for an Asheville hardware store by Davis, uh, about 1930, uh, but later um, descendants of uh, those Browns are still making face jugs in North Carolina, like this. <laughs> the humor inherent in some Anglo-Southern face jugs is nicely illustrated by this classic pose by Catawba Valley, North Carolina potter Harvey Reinhardt in the late 1930s when they were being made in larger numbers as novelties for sale to tourists. Reinhardt may have learned about face jugs from Casey Metters, who left Mossy Creek, Georgia in 1921 to settle at Catawba, North Carolina. Berlin Craig worked for neighbor Reinhardt before buying the operation and becoming one of the South's most famous folk potters in the later 20th century. His three-gallon face jug of about 1980 adds melted glass decoration, an older Catawba Valley technique revived by Burl, Burl Craig. The recent living tradition reveals further developments in the shifting meaning of Southern people pots. Lanier Metters of Mossy Creek in Northeast Georgia revitalized the face jug tradition in the late 1960s particularly uh, stimulated by the Smithsonian's Folklife Festivals, the first one uh, in 1967, making several thousand in his 25-year career. Lanier estimated 10,000. I don't think it was that many, but it was certainly in the thousands. Opening up a collector's market for them and establishing the face jug as an icon of Southern folk art. Here he was in 1975, signing his two-face jugs, which he called politician jugs after watching the Watergate hearings on TV. <laughs> Inheriting the old-fashioned hand skills of his father, Cheever Metters, and inspired by the artistry of his mother, Ari, Lanier experimented with sculpting and individualizing his face jugs, creating such departures as devil devil head jack-o'-lanterns, and wheel-thrown wig stands that aren't jugs anymore. He had one in his house with a mustard-colored wig that he liked to show off. Lanier's father, Cheever, made only a small number of face jugs in his long career. In contrast to Lanier's later ones, Cheever's were quite basic with simple facial features applied to the jug wall. Cheever didn't like the make them. As a collector, you had to twist his arm. He said, by the time I get it all fixed up, uh, I could have made three useful pieces. Lanier died in 1998, but other members of his family carry on. This is his cousin, Cleet Metters, Cleeter Metters III, with his devil jug, with melted glass decoration. Although not a Metters, Lanier's neighbor, Lynn Craven Tolbert, took up pottery as an adult after learning of the Craven family's long involvement in the craft in the South, the tradition that Mike Craven here belongs to. Informally apprenticing with the Fergusons of Gillsville, not raised in the tradition, she felt freer to exercise her creative spirit. This is her Indian owl totem face jug. 
The Fergusons have a six generations pottery history starting in Edgefield District, South Carolina. This devil monkey jug is the work of Stanley Ferguson, who maintains the family tradition today at Gillsville with his mother Mary and daughter Jamie Beth. Stanley's dad, the late Bobby Ferguson, used this brightly colored glazes to develop, uh, that were developed by his father, Pat, to appeal to a tourist market back in the 1930s and 40s. The first known potter to make face jugs in North Georgia was Charlie Ferguson, Pat's father, and grandson of Edgefield-trained Charles H. Ferguson. Like later generations, Charlie's face jugs had two different shapes, the monkey or field jug form, and the more standard jug form like this example of about 1900, unglazed, except for Albany slip highlighting the hair and eyes. Albany slip was a natural clay glaze imported from New York State, dug out of the Hudson River Valley, and southern potters began using it after the Civil War uh, as an alternative to the alkaline glazes that were more complicated to prepare. With Albany slip, you just took chunks of clay out of the barrel, pulverized them, soaked them in water, and you had a glaze that would withstand stoneware temperature. Smooth brown color, typically. I can't link Charlie's face jugs to those from Edgefield by African Americans or Thomas Chandler. His grandfather, Potter Charles H. Ferguson, came to Georgia from Edgefield before face jugs are known to have been made there. But the chances are pretty good that the Fergusons maintained contact with their Edgefield connections uh, after they had moved to Georgia and learned about face jugs that way. The Hewells of Gillsville were associated with the Fergusons through marriage. Will Hewell, probably learned to make face jugs from his Ferguson in-laws and liked to work up at Mossy Creek, where these Albany slip glazed examples of both jug forms probably were made in the early 1900s. The larger one on the right is the monkey jug form. Not exactly, but with an off-center angle spout. Encouraged by the success of his friend Lanier Metters, Fifth-generation potter Chester Huell revised his own, revived his own family's face jug tradition in the 1980s. The influence of these two families is circular, since Lanier's father, Cheever, had learned about face jugs from Will Huell, Chester's great uncle. One of Chester's innovations involved the size of his face jugs. He challenged himself to make some of the largest and smallest. You see the little one on the pocket watch, which is about an inch high. Huell's pottery at Gillsville is now in the hands of Chester's sons, Matthew and Nathaniel. This is Matthew sculpting face jugs in 1992. Returning to the issue of origins, we've seen how complex the story is. My research suggests that southern face vessels are neither clearly African nor European in background, but possibly a synthesis of these diverse sources reinterpreted in the United States with changes in meaning over time. For current folk potters, face jugs mean a major source of income from the collector's market. What has remained constant from their beginnings is that people pots have served folk potters as a vehicle for individual creative expression within their handcrafting tradition. Thank you. <laughs>